Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our monthly NDSA infrastructure interest group uh, facilitated conversation. I'm really happy today to introduce you to uh, Paul from University of Miami. Paul, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity there to introduce yourself and maybe just tell us a little bit about how you found your way to the NDSA. And then Paul is going to facilitate a conversation, sort of a software type show and tell. Um, and, and Paul, I guess uh, at this point, if, if we could maybe save the last five or 10 minutes for you know, for the working group um, business, that'd be wonderful. But uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to you for general introductions. And thanks again for moderating today. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to Corey and uh, Nathan for uh, kind of setting this up. And they've been uh, uh, great facilitators for the uh, infrastructure interest group. Um, so as, as Corey mentioned, my name is Paul Clow. I'm the uh, digital architect and infrastructure librarian from the University of Miami libraries. Um, I came to that role from Northwestern where I was the digitization systems librarian and also a uh, software developer for the Avalon project. Uh, what was then Hydra and now Sam Vera. Uh, so my background is uh, mostly in digitization, um, software development, and then also uh, digital preservation. Uh, and that's how I came to kind of know about the NDSA and the uh, IIG was uh, via the AP Trust, which is uh, an organization that University of Miami is a member of, which is a, a digital preservation service that we use at Miami very heavily uh, to help protect our collections. And uh, that's actually a great segue to our uh, first presenter, who is Andrew Diamond, who's the lead software developer at um, AP Trust. And he's going to talk about a tool that he's built, Dart. And uh, I've also asked him to talk about uh, a grant that he's involved with um, involving uh, Bagot and kind of harmonizing uh, the Bagot specification. So uh, without further ado, uh, hopefully Andrew is, uh, is ready and uh, willing to go um, and show us Dart. Yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right, I'm trying to figure out how I can share a screen. There's a share button down in the middle and then that'll let you choose your desktop okay. and your specific application. All right, I got it. Okay, so can you guys see what is mainly a blank window right now? Okay, so this is Dart, um, the digital archivist's resource tool. We um, created this for, uh, AP Trust recently opened up its preservation services to sub accounts, which are smaller institutions that have preservation needs, but don't necessarily have the know-how to um, bag up materials and send them up to S3 for ingest into AP Trust. So we created Dart, um, which allows you to uh, drag and drop the files you want to package. So I can just, drop in a set of files there. I can say that it needs to be packaged in Bagot format according to this um, AP Trust Bagot profile. Um, I'm gonna name this bag test files and um, AP Trust requires a minimal set of metadata in the bags that people upload. Uh, really, all I have to put in here is a title, um, a description, and uh, oh, the other one's already filled out. Um, this, our Bagot profile has more tags than we're showing this UI hides the ones that aren't necessary. It actually should be hiding a few more of these. Anyway, once I fill in the tag uh, values, I can choose an upload target where I want to send this to. 
This is our AP Trust um, demo system. And then I can review the job. It tells me the package name and where the files are coming from and um, how much stuff I'm sending. When I run the job, it creates the bag according to the AP Trust Bagit profile. It validates the bag. It's uploaded it to S3. Uh, and it tells me that all of these steps completed successfully. So at its core, Dart is a tool that allows non-technical users to uh, package files and send them to a preservation repository or send them just about anywhere. At the moment, it supports uh, Bagit packaging format. Um, in the future, it can support others like Zip and RAR and uh, OCFL and some others. Um, and also at the moment, it supports um, just S3 uploads. The whole system is built uh, with a plugin architecture so that other developers can write plugins to make this tool useful to their organization. Say internally, you want to use uh, OCFL for packaging and you want to use rsync for sending files to the destination repo. Um, you can write a plugin that creates OCFL packages and that would appear um, back here as under the packaging format and users could choose that. Um, you could also create a plugin that sends files by FTP or rsync or any other format you like. Um, we have a plugin that integrates with our AP Trust repositories REST API. It's not very elegant at the moment, but it does list which bags have been recently ingested. And work items is a list of uh, various tasks in our system that you as a depositor have kicked off. Um, you can write a plugin that would integrate Dart with your own repository as long as it has a REST API. Dart supports uh, custom Bagot profiles. You can load these in or you can um, actually customize them through this UI. And as soon as you have your profile customized and defined, uh, your depositors can start creating bags according to those profiles and validating bags according to those profiles. Um, we also have what are called setup plugins, which uh, the idea here is that your institution may use one or two bagot profiles and you may need to get your users set up with a whole bunch of internal settings like the URL of your FTP server or the credentials to upload to an S3 bucket. Um, you can write a setup module that installs most of the settings behind the scenes without the user doing anything and then walks them through a series of questions to fill in um, the remaining settings. And some of those settings may be difficult for users to enter on their own because uh, like the login credentials for an FTP server go in one place and uh, a piece of information like this, the street address of your deep and ingest node, that actually goes into a tag file, um, or sorry, a bagot profile. So this setup allows you to uh, install some default settings and walk the user through uh, few questions to get them up and running. Dart is built entirely with uh, JavaScript and HTML, so it should be fairly simple for developers to write plugins. They will not need to know the, how the internals of the system work. They just need to write plugins according to a, a very simple API. Um, so when we built this for our uh, our smaller depositors, we approached it with the idea that the tool could be useful to others in the future. 
um, and we came up with this plug-in architecture to make it easily expandable. Um, Dart also runs in command line mode. So if you have workflows that you've scripted with Python or Ruby or just about any other language, um, you can use all of Dart's features from the command line uh, through your scripts. Um, it's also cross-platform. It runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, it uses Electron, which has some nice benefits, including an auto-update feature so that uh, people don't have to keep downloading the latest version. We can, we can push versions out to them. But our hope is that uh, one is that we have a feature complete version ready in the next three months or so, um, though that would be an alpha version. And two, that uh, other organizations and other developers can see how this would uh, serve some needs in their organization. And we hope that they will contribute some plugins and customizations that make this tool more useful to the broad community. Do you guys have any questions about, um, about what I just covered? Nathan, you look a little perplexed. I'm just wondering about the command line interface. Um, is it akin to using um, just like a, a bagger? I'm sorry, bag it from a, a command line. Is it uh, a very Dart specific? Because um, uh, you said it, it uses the full features of Dart. Um, uh, is there any part of that that's uh, demoable? Although I don't want to eat, um, Paul should play timekeeper. I don't want to go too far into the weeds. Um, yeah, so basically when you use the UI, Dart creates a JSON file that describes the job you're going to run. Um, to use it from the command line, can you see the, the black screen, the command window? Um, you'd run a, a command like this. The first part is just the path to the Dart executable on my machine. And then I give it this parameter job and a path to the JSON file that contains the job. When I run that, um, it actually just ran an almost identical job to the one I completed a minute ago. This is the log file that says, um, it started to build the package. Then down here, it, Sorry, logs a little verbose. It validated the package. And then um, in this part, it uploads it, says the upload completed and exits with code zero. So the idea for the command line tool is that um, you have a basic template of the JSON file. And for any job that you want to run, you're going to say, um, start with my basic template and I'm gonna add in a few lines of JSON. One specifies the files I'm gonna to add to this bag. Uh, another specifies the name of the bag, and then a few lines of code to specify specific tag values for that bag. Um, so ideally, you know, each job that you run from a script takes um, just a few lines of Ruby or Python code. Um, then it'll merge those settings into the JSON template, run the whole job, and give a return code to your script. Does that make sense? So that also makes it sort of language agnostic um, from the scripting perspective, because you're just you're calling an executable from the command line. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's a work in progress. It's getting there. There was a version, we put out a version last year that was um, a prototype, kind of a proof of concept. And uh, it worked for a number of organizations who pushed quite a bit of content into AP Trust with it. Um, 
but it was a prototype and the code was brittle and it wasn't something that was built for long-term maintainability. This is version 2.0, which um, is built for the long haul. Andrew, I have a, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, feedback there. Um, we, we use a combination of, uh, you know, recommending folks use exactly to create their bags. And then we have um, sort of an own cloud layer that um, helps people do the drag and drop into this locks network that we've developed within Copal. And I'm just wondering, this tool looks really cool. And um, I'm wondering if you've had conversations with other networks about adapting it outside the AP trust model. Oh yeah. So, um, you know, it should be able to upload to any target you give it as long as there is a plugin that speaks the required network protocol. So even the existing library that we're using for uploads to S3, it's, it's the min IO library, which we'll talk to any S3 compatible API. Um, but we already know, we already have requests for FTP and, and rsync. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it, it supports any kind of custom Bagot profile you can come up with. And uh, if your remote repository has a REST API, um, you can pull information back from that REST API to display in Dart. That again is a question of writing a plugin. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks very much. Corey, um, there's a fair chance um, I might be trying to, depending on the way some things go, um, might try to get Dart to uh, work in the meta archive context in a very similar manner um, to, to what um, you're doing with Locks and Own Cloud. Um, with Meta Archive and the Supernode um, project. So uh, um, we might have some uh, uh, collaborative uh, exploration um, together perhaps around that. Yeah, that'd be really great. Um, similar underlying infrastructure, maybe we could share like some developer time or something. Definitely reach out. Absolutely. So um, Paul asked me to speak a little bit about uh, this common Bagot profile as well. Um, Dart would be able to produce that, produce bags according to this common Bagot profile. This is um, uh, work coming out of a grant from Aviva Weinrob and Laura Alanya at Northwestern University. We're trying to come up with a single, relatively simple Bagot profile that would be acceptable to all distributed digital preservation repositories. Um, when you look at the profiles that different distributed repositories have used in the past, uh, they've been pretty similar. There's not a huge amount of difference between the, the AP Trust Bagot profile and the Deepin Bagot profile, though. Um, you know, AP Trust would only accept theirs and Deepin would only accept theirs. The idea here with, with um, Aviva and Laura's grant is to create a single, fairly simple profile that can then be exported by Fedora and other commonly used tools to uh, send bags to any, any remote, sorry, distributed digital repository. So we're getting close to defining that. Um, Dart will support it, AP Trust will support it, and um, some other tools in the future as well will support it. And um, to Corey's question a couple minutes ago, uh, that guy, Teeb, I can't remember his name. Yeah, Tib at uh, Stanford. Yes, um, he was talking about, he was, during this grant, we had a discussion about um, his need for uh, a locks node to turn around and bag up some content it's received and send it off to another locks node. Um, so he has some interest in the uh, command line version of Dart. 
which could be used for that purpose. So um, we haven't talked further since then. That was a couple months ago, but I guess I'll see him again in August and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Great. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, did anyone have any questions uh, for Andrew before we moved on to the next presenter? Okay. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Uh, sure. It looks like a great tool. So uh, I'm looking forward to playing with it in the future. All right. Uh, so next up, our next presenter is uh, Hillel Arnold, who is the head of digital programs at the Rockefeller Archive Center. Uh, and Hillel has agreed to talk to us a little bit about uh, Project Electron, um, which is uh, kind of a, a multifaceted project that they have going on at uh, Rockefeller Archive Center. So uh, Hillel, if you're ready to go, um, we're looking forward to hearing about Project Electron. All right. Um, okay, so yeah, this is going to be a little, uh, a little less demo-y and a little more uh, PowerPoint-y and hand-wavy, so um, bear with me. But let me, um, let me see if I can share my screen here. All right. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, now you can see that I'm checking out ESPN. Um, let me unshare and see if I can get this thing back. Uh, here we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, how's that? Um, can you see that now? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, so that URL there is, I'm going to try and go pretty fast. So that URL there is a website that will link to a lot of the things that I'm talking about. So feel free to, to jump there and just poke around on your own. Um, but as uh, by setting way of setting context, um, the Rockefeller Archive Center, um, collects a lot of records from active organizations. Um, so kind of one of, that's I think one of the main ways in which we differ from other archival organizations is that we don't get just one time dumps from people. We get ongoing um, accruals to existing collections. And so um, one of the, the ongoing struggles that we've had is how to um, integrate our systems in a way that, that um, allows that work to happen um, in a way that's scalable. So. Um, this, I just wanted to kind of like say this is sort of where we started uh, thinking about this project um, because I think it's a, it's a fairly common starting spot for a lot of um, organizations. Uh, we had a couple of different systems that were doing things. We had some kind of a sense of what those systems were doing, um, but uh, they weren't really integrated very well. Um, there were some scripts that did some things, but those scripts were not well documented. They were written in, in a variety of different languages. They weren't always deployed with version control. Um, and there weren't good testing environments where we, could, where we could make changes to code and then push those changes up into production um, and feel relatively confident that things would not break. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, we started off um, by kind of defining sort of like how we wanted to work, even before we, we defined um, what we wanted to do, um, which uh, is, is an approach that we've, we've taken here for a while and it seems to work pretty well for us. Um, so we created these four project values, um, which uh, I've just given you kind of like the headline um, for each of those values, um, but there are some explanatory text that explains what the heck we mean by each of those. Um, that goes along with those. Um, again, you can find a lot of this stuff on our website, but I'm happy to talk about more about any of this um, if we need to. Um, so, so this is kind of like, this is sort of the problem statement um, that we were trying to, to get to with, uh, with this um, project, which is that um, we wanted to regularize transfers of, of um, digital records. Um, we wanted to implement sensible automation um, that kept humans in the loop where it needed to, but that also allowed us to scale. Um, and what's kind of like implicit in this is that we wanted to build on, on existing tools and solutions and standards. We didn't want to have the, 
to, to think that we were sort of starting from scratch or have, have this kind of like the arrogance to think that nobody had tried to solve this before. Um, so I think a lot of the standards that um, were just mentioned with Dart uh, are in play here as well. Um, bag it, bag it, profiles, premise, um, all that kind of stuff is, is sort of baked into what we're trying to do. Um, so, um, and then I think the, the last thing that I just wanted to say about this is, you know, is, um, as was just mentioned, you know, like maintenance of, of this stuff over time is, is something that is worth uh, thinking about. And um, we, we also, like, we were aware that this project was going to mean the accumulation of a lot of tactical debt. Um, and so we wanted to be sensible about how we did that. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me, let me stop talking in abstractions and show you some uh, architecture diagrams, which everyone loves. Um, so we came up with this, this uh, approach to tying together systems that was based on microservices. The idea here was that um, instead of building integrations between systems directly in systems, um, which we've done a little bit of before, um, we wanted to keep our integrations outside of those systems um, because there's a lot, we, I think we realized that there's a lot of, of um, our specific use cases that were kind of leaking into these, uh, these integrations in a way that was, was probably detrimental to um, these other applications as a whole and to the community. Um, and so this is a way of kind of keeping our, our uh, particularities to ourselves. Um, so uh, th these are kind of like, I'm gonna show you another view of sort of this, but these are sort of like the major components that of, of how we did this. Um, at the top there, you see kind of like those, those green systems, which are things like um, Archive Space and Archimatica, um, Fedora, other kind of little sort of like systems that do a thing um, and that have a particular uh, domain. And we try to kind of touch those as little as possible. Um, we do participate in those communities pretty actively, but um, we're looking there to kind of like sort of make those systems do the thing that they do as, as well as possible. Um, sitting below that is an API gateway, which just manages um, a lot of the, the routes, um, does some redirection to things underneath it, um, and also handles things like authentication and, and, um, and logging and a little bit of UI so you can see what's going on um, underneath the hood. Um, the API gateway um, and the services, which is the layer below, are both, um, they're both Django um, and uh, applications, they're all Django applications. Um, so this was kind of like one way that we tried to manualize our um, maintenance burden was just to try and write in a, a particular framework as much as possible. Um, so the services that sit below the API gateway um, as you can see, can talk to each other or can talk through the API gateway and can be talked to through the API gateway. Um, and they, so each of those, there's those services, I'll show you this in a little bit, your services are bundled together in, in two microservice applications. Each of those services is an endpoint, which means you can get at it via HTTP and it'll do a thing. Um, and then there's a message queue under that, which is um, RabbitMQ um, that, handles kind of queuing of things and so we can scale appropriately. Um, and then underneath there, there's some, some shared storage which allows us to move binary files around um, without having to do things like rsync. Um, so those are the major components. This is how this all fits together. Um, the one thing in this diagram that you may be like, what the heck is that is the thing on the left side, the green box on the left side is Aurora, which is um, an application that we built out that is in many ways very, very similar to uh, Dart um, that handles the, the transfer of um, digital records to us. Um, it's a little bit more, the, the assumptions we made with Aurora are a little bit more based around automation and they account for some um, user intervention for appraisal and accessioning. Um, I can talk more about that if folks are interested about it. Then that's probably like a whole other thing. Um, so you can kind of see here how, um, if you follow the numbers and the arrows, how data flows through this, um, this environment. Uh, each of those white boxes in the, in the middle that has a funny constellation name, uh, that is a microservice application. And there are uh, multiple services that are part of each of those applications. Um, 
So data kind of like flows in through Aurora, then through Archive Matica into Fedora and, uh, and Archive Space. Um, I, I think I had slides that kind of like break down what each of these microservices does. I'm wondering though, that seems like it might be a little overkill for the context of this uh, conversation. Um, I'm happy to zip through those, but you can also do that on your own. Uh, I'm happy to, to share our URLs and all that stuff. Um, do you have any, any direction uh, for that, Paul, or? Oh, I'm sorry, this is Robin um, Regaber from UVA. And I was wondering, uh, in your diagram where you were showing the flow, there didn't seem to be any kind of data flowing from archive space back into the system. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, how did you get to the, the descriptive metadata uh, bundled up with your, or maybe you don't, but how do you get that with your digital objects and then also put into preservation? Yeah, okay, so good, good question. Um, it's one of the one of the <laughs> things I kind of alighted over here. Um, that's part of that's part of what happens in Aurora. So we have a, a Bagot profile. Actually, we have the ability to to create and manage Bagot profiles in Aurora, um, similar to how you, what you saw in um, in Dart. Um, so we can we can specify sort of a, a metadata set that we want to get from from folks, uh, and that can be specified per organization. Um, so that we can do some some decent sort of control vocabulary kind of stuff um, per, per organization. Um, so we're getting we're getting a lot of that data from there. Um, then we're really storing a pretty minimal metadata set in Fedora. Um, we're not storing a ton of of descriptive metadata in Fedora. Um, we're really at this point we're we're storing that primarily in archive space because that's the place where we manage it. It's a place where our archivists manage it. Um, like part two of this project, which we have just started on is then, okay, we have this stuff. Uh, what do we do with it? And how do we make it available? So, um, so we're, we're, we're working on that now, but I think that, um, I think that may be part of where you're going with this Robin, which is like, okay, so, <laughs> so what, what's stored where? Um, and, and so that's, I think that's a good question. We, we didn't want to, like, there's a, there's a certain amount of overhead to getting a lot of descriptive metadata into Fedora, right? Cause you've got to, to turn it into RDF and then, um, and then you've got to get it to get it back out of Fedora. Then you've got to do something on the other end. So, um, yeah, we're and sure, I know that we're, Fedora sure we going to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Fedora six may uh, solve a lot of problems for people. I was just asking that because I think, you know, for preservation, you know, if you had one instance get wiped off the map, you'd want all that descriptive metadata and technical metadata, everything that proves the provenance of mm -hmm. something to be located in another area. Yeah, so the, the other thing that's missing from this is, uh, we're Meta Archive members, so the other thing that's missing from this is, um, is an integration with Meta Archive where we'll push these these bags into Meta Archive. Uh, That's the other thing I okay. should have said. Like th these are bags too. They're not like they're not just uh, random files that are getting pushed to us. So okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I've just rejoined this after a long absence, and uh, it's nice to have these presentations as part of this first meeting I dipped into. I'll try to be quiet. <laughs> no need for that, Robin. We uh, appreciate your input. Thank you. Uh, Corey, or sorry, uh, Hillel, I was hunting for the uh, unmute button um, when you had asked about <laughs> um, kind of zipping through. Um, I, I personally would be interested in, in uh, maybe if you could just kind of quickly go through the microservices architecture. Um, sure. The way that you've uh, set things up uh, is something um, that, you know, we'd at least be interested in, in taking a look at at Miami. Uh, the, the overview you presented was um, was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the the kind of like 
you know, the, this information is all available in the readme's for each of these repositories. So, so if you, you can go back at any point and just find this stuff. So, um, so I'll just walk through the four of these. I think actually there's five of them. I'll walk through, one of them is pretty underdeveloped. I'll, I'll just, just go through these. So, um, and they're, they're all kind of structured in the same way, which is that they sort of indicate like the, the green thing in the middle is the actual application and kind of lists out the services are, are articulated in each of those gray horizontal boxes. Uh, if that makes sense. So, so a service just means there's an endpoint um, to it that, that will trigger a thing. Um, so, so this is kind of like the first thing that we're, we're, and Robin, this might answer some of your questions too, where things flow in. Um, so when a user creates an accession in, in Aurora, um, then some accession data gets created um, in, in Ursa Major, this first app, uh, microservice application. Um, some other packaging and stuff happens in um, in Aurora, and then when that work is done, um, then this this bag discovery service is triggered, which says like, "Hey, where are the what new binaries are there? What do I know about?" Um, and it'll do a bit of work to unpack um, these packages and uh, save some metadata and ship them off to the next microservices, which is uh, Fornax. In a lot of these that last, you'll see a, a cleanup service that just is there for us to, uh, to kind of, we want to sort of set, make sure that we articulated very clearly um, sort of like which, which applications and which services had right, right uh, permissions to particular directories and which did not. So that's really kind of like what this is about is just managing file permissions um, so we don't trip over um, ourselves. So that's, that's the one, then that's for first one. Then it moves on to this next um, microservice application um, where, you know, if, if you remember, um, once, once bags are kind of stored in, in that, that bag store or some major, um, they're saved in this, this next, a post request is sent to this next microservice, um, which is Fornax. Um, and this, this um, microservice bundles things up. It, 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 it creates what, what Archimatic refers to as transfers. Um, I guess could also be in some land referred to as SIPs. Um, so uh, it does a bunch of, it restructures things, adds a bunch of metadata, um, pulls in some automated Archimatic configurations, blah, de, blah, de, blah, um, all kinds of stuff that just basically allows those packages to be processed through Archivematica in a really consistent way, um, which is something that we have struggled with in the past. Um, and then it uses the Archivematica API to start and approve transfers. Um, and it'll actually like clean up the Archivematica dashboard once things have been processed through so you don't have a bajillion things hanging out in the dashboard. Um, so basically what it does is it allows us to, to kind of like use Archivematica really as, a, as an automated ape maker ape and dip maker, I guess, um, rather than something where a person is clicking around in the UI a lot. Um, once things are, are stored in Archivematica, um, there's another microservice then that, that pulls um, the storage service API and says, hey, what packages do you have? Do I know about you already? Um, and if not, it downloads that package um, and then pushes um, things into Fedora. Uh, it does things a little bit differently based on whether a package is an ape or a dip. Um, and then it passes some information along to the next um, microservice, which is called Aquarius, which is probably the most complicated one, um, which, is, which deals with archive space data. So it's really like, this is, this is where sort of the, you know, Robin, to your earlier question, this is where the binaries get shoved and then we say, okay, we have an identifier for those binaries. We're gonna pass that information along to archive space along with all the descriptive metadata that we have. Um, and uh, so here's in, in archive space, this is where like, as I said, it's, it's fairly complex. So um, our assumption is that an accession consists of one or more transfers uh, bags and this, uh, let's, let's call them bags since we're talking to people who know that. Um, and uh, so in archive space, for each accession that gets created in Aurora, we'll have an accession record. 
Um, and then we'll have what I've called a grouping component, which um, for those of you that are somewhat familiar with, um, with archive space, it just means that it's, a, it's something like a series or a record group or something like that that has uh, children. Um, and then as, as sort of children come, as children of that grouping component for each bag that comes in, we create a file level um, component as well. Uh, so basically when all is said and done, you've got, um, you've got an accession record, you've got uh, a grouping component that has a bunch of children. Uh, so, um, so you've got a lot of data that's in archive space. Uh, oh, and you also have digital objects, sorry, that, that, and that uses the, the uh, DRI that you get back from Fedora. Um, so that's kind of like the most, that's where like the meat of like, that's where most of the code is that we wrote was this one. Um, uh, so that's basically, that's basically the last of the chain. We do have this one other um, microservice that's called Libra. It's a little underdeveloped, I will be completely honest. Um, the idea with this was that we would be able to use the Fedora API to, to, to generate reports that are kind of based on the NDSA levels of preservation. Um, so that we'd be able to say, hey, we want to report on all the formats, we want to report on uh, fixity, um, which are things that you can get through the, the um, Fedora API, but this just gave us, this would give us a UI for that. Uh, it's a little underbaked. Um, I think we're, we're still looking for kind of um, the sweet spot there in, in, in terms of like what where are we actually doing something that other people haven't done before and where, what have, has already been developed that doesn't, we don't do reinvent the way along. So um, I think that's, those are, that's the, the kind of zip through all the various services. Um, I didn't put it in here. Oh, well, um, I did, I did create like a really long um, <laughs> diagram, which I can, I can share out. I did create a really long diagram that, that ties all these things together and shows you kind of like the sequence of them as well. Yep. Hey, hello. Thank you for this. This is Sally. Um, Hi, Sally. Hey. Um, <laughs> the, so I was hoping you could just comment on um, like the status of the different parts of your very well thought out and beautifully documented architecture. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, which parts are in dev, which parts are in prod, or which parts are you using, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so we have um, Aurora is, um, a, it's in production. We don't, we actually, we're, we're going to start taking transfers uh, from one of our major donors. Um, probably next week. Um, so that's in production. The, all of the microservices st stuff has been deployed um, in development and we're about to deploy in production as well. So, um, so we're pretty far down the road. Um, I think like the, we'll continue to, um, we'll continue to, to make changes to this, but, um, but it's all, it's all working uh, pretty well. So, um, and we're, I, I guess I never said this, but we're, this stuff is all up in AWS as well. So um, I think like, I know that's something that a lot of other folks use. Um, although I think that you could deploy this probably almost anywhere. There's not really much that's AWS specific. Great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, hello, how, how large a team are, or do you have working on this project? Um, so uh, that is a great question. Um, on my team, uh, there are three other really smart archivists, um, and none of whom are trained as developers or software engineers. Um, we have managed to get some uh, really good uh, support from Marist College, which is um, a small liberal arts school that's just up the river from us. Um, and so we, we've kind of entered into a partnership with them where they, they've been able to provide us some, some code review and um, assistance on, on just sort of like technical direction. Uh, but the majority of the code was written by uh, probably like two or three folks that, that work for me 
so including me. So it's not it's not a big team. Um, when what we've done is we've we've tried to to pull in staff from other um, other parts of the organization to do a lot of the um, the requirements gathering and the user stories and all that kind of stuff, um, which was was useful both in terms of taking some of that load off of us, but also in terms of, of uh, building buy-in and um, like as you can imagine, in a project like this, um, there's a lot of like organizational changes implicated in that in a project like this, is, and that's also another reason why we started with the values was to be like, okay, we're not trying to like, you know come in and save your life with technology we're trying to this is what we're trying to do um work with us on it so um yeah it's 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 been interesting do we have any other questions no not at the moment Okay, thanks, Salel. Um, like I said, I thought that was really interesting. I actually, um, the what you said about organizational change and the project values also really resonates with me. I think that's something um, uh, in my previous experience and my current experience is something um, that plays a, large, a much larger role in some of these systems changes than uh, it gets it gets credit for. So um, that'd be something I'd be interested in hearing more about uh, at another time. Yeah, absolutely. It's I'm happy to talk about that at any time. That's been a really big piece of this project. <laughs> and uh, so as a, a late addition to the uh, agenda, uh, I was actually at a workshop last week for a tool that I thought might be of interest to kind of a digital preservation audience, although it wasn't necessarily uh, designed for that explicitly. Um, so I was at a workshop for a tool called Wax, which is uh, developed, it's a uh, digital collections uh, tool that was developed at Columbia University Libraries by um, Marie Nyrop, who's a software developer in the libraries there, and Alex Gill, who's a digital scholarship librarian. Uh, and it's uh, kind of based on the principles of uh, what they call minimal computing. Uh, and the idea is, uh, let me kind of share my, uh, brought some of this up, uh, if I can find Firefox here. So minimal computing is, is kind of aimed at, um, underserved population. So I think it's not generally aimed uh, towards some of the organizations that we all are probably a part of, but I think the tool itself and, and uh, some of the outcomes um, that come from these principles are really lend themselves to digital preservation and uh, kind of easing the burden um, of digital preservation. Uh, and so the presentation or the workshop that I it was on the tool Wax, which is, as I said, a digital collections tool, and it's based on um, Jekyll. So it is a way of creating, so here it is, uh, here's the GitHub repository, it's minicomp slash Wax at GitHub. And uh, it's basically a really easy way of creating a really nice digital collections uh, application, like kind of a digital collections website. But the nice thing about it is it's because it's built on Jekyll, it's all a static site. So although it has some kind of interesting interactive features, as you can see here, uh, this is all kind of in a single package. So it's not hitting a database built in one little site. And uh, that's the background kind of I came project with. So it's even got search going on. Uh, so it has a really nice, um, I thought it was a really nice project uh, and I thought it would make uh, kind of capturing digital collections, um, especially legacy websites, which is a problem that I'm going to be dealing with uh, very in the, in the very short term future, um, a lot easier and uh, being able to preserve some of these digital collections that I'm sure we all have these legacy websites that are, you know, maybe a few hundred items, but are stored in a MySQL database and kind of uh, how long can we kind of limp along with old MySQL versions and um, kind of the maintenance, Hillel kind of um, touched on the maintenance issues, which is something that I've uh, had a lot of experience on uh, 
you know, in my background is kind of the maintenance of a lot of these projects. So what's nice about Wax, uh, and here's a, a site that I put together really quickly from one of our, uh, one of our collections at University of Miami, is uh, it just takes basically as its input uh, some uh, high quality TIFFs or JPEGs and a CSV of uh, metadata and allows you to really simply put to these sites that then you can, um, you can see they've integrated a triple IF viewer here. So you can kind of have all of the nifty gizmos that people are used to, but have it all in a package that is easily preservable. You can just kind of package it up and, and place it wherever you like, um, or even, you know, bag it. And um, wherever you, you drop it off in the future, it's basically uh, everything is, uh, all in one, um, all in one nice package. So uh, I just kind of wanted to. I wasn't sure uh, how widely um, this project was known about, um, but uh, coming from kind of a digital preservation angle, I thought it was something that would be really useful. So um, again, that was developed at Columbia University uh, Libraries. I'm not responsible in any way for it, but it was a, a project that I find uh, really useful and I think uh, I'll be able to take advantage of, as I said, with some of the legacy websites that I'll be dealing with in the future. So unless anyone has any questions about that, um, I can uh, just turn it over to Nathan and Corey for uh, admin discussion from uh, the IIG. Thanks so much, Paul. Really appreciate that. Nathan, I noticed you were taking uh, copious notes. Thank you so much for that as well. Yeah, so um, Nathan, um, yeah, and uh, Paul Hillel and um, Andrew, uh, really appreciate uh, your efforts today in helping us um, understand the projects and sharing your experiences. It was a really great session. So thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Um, yeah, you know, and um, actually, I think there's there's not that much on the agenda. Uh, we just wanted to bring to your attention uh, that the um, the July call will be at the regular time, um, and the August call is going to uh, shift three hours earlier. So, Mark, your, if you have a reoccurring calendar appointment on uh, August nineteenth, the infrastructure interest group call will be at nine a.m. Pacific, twelve p.m. Eastern. And as I say here in CBC in Canada, 1230 in Newfoundland. But um, that's, uh, yeah, and, and Nathan, anything else we should mention about, uh, yeah, anything else? Um, maybe a couple small things. Uh, there's an open agenda for the next meeting. Uh, so if you have a, uh, a topic of burning interest that uh, you would like to talk about with the infrastructure introduced intra in infrastructure interest group community uh, please bring back to the next meeting you can add things directly to the agenda you can email them to the group um, Corey or I will send out a call a couple weeks before the meeting to remind folks as well um, so hopefully we can have a lively discussion uh, for that um, registration is open for NDSA DigiPres um, this October um, back to back with DLF forum um, so uh, you can start to register I hear the hotels um, uh, block is filling up um, so if that's something um, or uh, if you are, are sort of putting that off um, uh, you might want to make your reservations now um, and I see we have uh, the uh, conference chair on the call with us um, is there any any plug you'd like to make civil for the conference put you on the spot of course that's okay if you don't have to. <laughs> no, I just it took me a little while to find the unmute button. Um, <laughs> I think the only thing to say is that we're putting the schedule together and it looks like a, it's shaping up to be a pretty fantastic schedule. We've got a lot of panels, especially that are um, uh, of high interest to, to many folks. Uh, I forgot exactly what the timeline is for the notification of proposal acceptance, but I think it's within the next couple of weeks. Sounds good. Uh, any any other questions, comments from uh, from folks on the call? Oh, hey, can I can I just make a plug for another conference? This is Halal. 
Absolutely. <laughs> so some of you, I think, know about this already, um, but there's a conference happening um, in October in Washington, D.C. called The Maintainers. I'll drop a, a thing, or maybe Nathan's doing it already, um, a link into chat. Um, uh, it's a it's a conference that's going on for the past probably about five years now, um, focused around uh, the work of maintenance. Um, this year, there's a there's a real effort to um, get a lot of people who are actually doing maintenance work, practitioners, um, at the conference, um, and it's broken into four tracks. Um, the two that are probably most specific to this community are uh, software and information. Um, I happen to be co-chairing the information track along with uh, uh, Taylor Scott Weber and um, Juliana Castro. So um, that that program is also coming together and it's looking really great. So um, so I think keep your eyes on that, uh, especially if you're local to the DC area and, and uh, think about coming. Sounds great. Put some uh, links in the chat and I'll get them on the um, agenda notes as well. Um, Thanks. All right. Corey, anything else? No, that's that's it for me. I mean, the, the only other thing I was going to mention is I think I saw the email this morning that a preliminary schedule for IPRES has also been released today, um, just to continue with the conference theme. But yeah, no, that's all I have. Uh, so. All right. Everyone enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thank you for joining us. Um, I look forward to digging in. Uh, to learn more uh, about these tools. Um, and uh, really, if that, that, the big long chart, Hillel, if you could include that, um, even if we can't possibly view it on one slide or computer at one time, uh, <laughs> it, would, it would be interesting to see it all, all in context. There was a lot, a lot of detail in there. Um, but uh, look forward to the, the work is great happening at Rockefeller Archive Center. Thanks sure. so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks again to the speakers. And thank you, Paul, for facilitating. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Hillel. Appreciate it. See ya. See ya. Bye, everyone.